you, Lisa, for that introduction. Uh, now it's my honour to introduce today's guest, Lisa Davies. Lisa Davies is the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald and she began her career at the National Newswire AAP and has also worked for the UK's Press Association in London and the Daily Telegraph newspaper in Sydney. Lisa joined Fairfax Media in early 2012. She's held several senior reporting and editing roles, including Deputy Editor, Investigations Editor and Justice Editor. In 2016, she was also Fairfax Media's Federal Election Editor, which I'm sure was a very big job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lisa has had a particular focus on crime and court reporting in her career, including travelling to South Africa to cover the Oscar Pistorius murder trial and publishing a book about the inspiring recovery of Sydney bashing victim Lauren Huxley. So please join me in welcoming Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So ladies and gentlemen, we will have some time for questions um, at the at the end, so a bit of Q&A with, with Lisa, but I've, I'm going to kick things off uh, firstly. And, and Lisa, we just heard a few of your career highlights and what you do, but mm. can I take you back and, and can you tell us what led you to journalism in the first place? Yeah, it's a sort of funny story really, because apparently when I was very young, um, you know, as I was heading towards sort of the age of 10 or 11, um, apparently I just started saying when people asked me what I, what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, uh, that I wanted to be a journalist. And my mum was sort of a bit confused, well not confused, but something like, okay, that's weird. Um, and she thought, I thought, oh, writing, yeah, she's very good at the writing. Um, and then I sort of kept talking about it and she thought, oh, terrific, she's going to be a novelist, that's great. Like, I was quite creative and, you know, best-selling author, my mother thought this was going to be, this is going to be great. Um, but I just kind of, it was weird, I, I didn't even, I remember the first time telling someone about that, um, that I wanted to be a journalist and not really even knowing what it was. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it just sort of happened. I ended up, um, you know, I was really, I really enjoyed English at school and um, when I went to university, it was just a sort of no-brainer for me that I was gonna get into the media and um, just sort of went, went straight into um, University of Queensland. I was at school in Brisbane. And um, yeah, just, it just sort of happened from there. And um, I feel very fortunate about that because I know that so many people as they're growing up sort of changed idea, have lots of ideas and don't quite, quite know which, which way to, to, what to pursue. And I think I, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate that I sort of had this idea out of nowhere that that's what I wanted to do and here I am today. So it's it sort of worked out okay, I think. Yeah, <laughs> obviously meant to be. It yeah, sounds like so. it was just a real calling yeah, from, the, yeah. from the start. Lisa, I mentioned a few of the, the stories you've covered, the yeah. federal election, the Oscar yeah. Pistorius. What do you consider your, your career highlights? Um, I think there's probably a couple. I mean, the Pistorius case was amazing. I'm sure um, most people in this room will remember uh, this uh, Paralympian, this um, incredibly inspiring individual who competed at the Olympic Games in um, 2012 in London, I think the London Games he ran, um, notwithstanding he's a double amputee and had had a really, and, you know, courageous, you know, fight to, to become an athlete and incredibly fit and a huge uh, identity in South Africa. Like he was very much looked upon there as this sort of, um, yeah, a bit of a demigod, I guess. Like uh, in South Africa, when I was there, uh, people were kind of shattered about what had happened because, of course, he went on to um, shoot dead his girlfriend, um, who was in the in the bathroom of their of the of his unit. Um, the idea to go and cover that came about quite spontaneously. Um, I randomly said to my boss, my fo my then boss, who former editor of the Herald, Judith Whelan. Um, that I wanted to go and would she let me go because actually I really wanted to go on safari um, <laughs> and I had some holidays due so I thought I could do both and she, we, we built a business case for it because it wouldn't have normally been something, I mean he's not an Australian, you know, the, the, the sort of reasons that we would send someone to an event like that weren't obvious but I built a case for it and it turned out to be hugely successful for our digital um, readers and, and also subscribers. So. Um, Look, that was an incredible experience. I can't really explain to you what it was like being in that room when he was giving evidence, when there were these incredible moments in the trial of like heartbreaking testimony and just some, some quite violent and graphic information that was shown. And just the camaraderie of the reporters that were there, it was, you know, I've made, I was sitting, it sort of was a real pinch me moment. I was sitting in the row in the court just behind um, CNN, 
the BBC, the London Times, the Telegraph UK, um, you know, the Guardian, the International Guardian media, like there's just every major news organisation was represented and I was incredibly proud that I was there for the City Morning Herald. I was the only print journalist to go. Um, I think Channel 9 and Channel 7 both had sent people, but that was it. And we had a ball as well, as horrible as the evidence was. Um, uh, the actual experience of being there. And so Judith allowed me to go for three three weeks with one week's holiday afterwards. I stayed for seven um, because the evidence was just so amazing and it just kept dragging out. And then I went back for the verdict a few months later. So I think that was that was a highlight. I mean, federal election too, I have to say on, a dom on the domestic side, um, you know, that was an intense eight weeks of ridiculous campaigning. And while I didn't travel or, or do anything, it was, you know, it was actually the, a real challenge for us to keep people interested. <laughs> um, you know, the Prime Minister made this decision to have this incredibly long campaign. Um, I think he probably regrets that now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it was it was a real you know it was a massive effort to wrangle people and wrangle our bureau and and uh, you know have some big projects and some events and and it was a, it was really great. And I, I mean I do love politics, so I haven't ever really covered it to a great extent. But I but I've always been fascinated and interested in it. So yeah, I think those two things are, are probably in the top. Yeah, definitely in the top five. <laughs> Well, after obviously a very successful career as a journalist, you are now you've risen yeah. to the to the ranks of, of like editor. Yeah. That must have been a huge, a huge honour to. It certainly is, and and you know I. I never had this ambition of doing this. Um, you know, in fact, a few when I was made editor, my dad said to me, "Wow, like I remember it wasn't long ago you were saying to me you just wanted to keep writing, you didn't want to rise up through the ranks and." Oh, that went well. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly proud of what the Herald does. I felt a natural, um, when I was poached to go there from the Daily Telegraph, um, it wasn't like I'd been dying to work there for my whole career. I, it just was an opportunity that came up and I hadn't really given it much thought. And I went across as the crime editor, crime and justice editor. And... I remember in my first week there, even though the job was bigger, more pressure, um, more people, like I had a number of more direct reports, I actually felt, I had never felt more supported um, and and just engaged with the people that I worked with. Um, I mean, journalists are funny creatures, and I'm sure you <laughs> would agree. Um, we have a very close-knit working relationship, and I mean, a lot of my best friends are people I started with. Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So, I mean, we, we stay close when we're, when we're close, I think. Um, but at the Herald, I've just found some incredible people to work with and, and it just feels like an environment where we support each other and compete with our competitors, not compete internally, which is, you know, that's a feature of some other newsrooms and that's mm. fine. And, and look, I did, you know, to some extent, that was a big part of what helped me along my career at News Corp. But... Um, yeah, I have to say the Herald is, you know, and it's been through the ringer. Like you can't go, I mean, I can't go anywhere really without people sort of saying, oh, you know, oh, how's it all going? And I think we've done a pretty bad job of talking about the huge positives that we have and the incredible trajectory that we are still on, notwithstanding the white noise of, of stuff that, that people mostly hear about. Um, and I'm sure I'll get a question about the, nine, the Channel 9 merger at some point, but we can talk about that then. But I, I'm... I think the resilience and the um, and the camaraderie that we have in the newsroom is well. It keeps me going to work every day, and I'm incredibly proud to lead that group of people. It's um, it's amazing. Now I know there's no such thing as a typical day <laughs> in any newsroom, but walk us through sort of a, a day in in your life as as editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. <laughs> yeah, you'll realise after this little thing that I don't have a life. Um, <laughs> no, so basically, I every day is really different. Um, uh, for example, on Monday, I mean, I have I do a lot of publicly, fa you know, outward facing stuff, um, which I really like doing. I think it's really important for people to understand the Herald, where we're coming from, and, and our voice in in the community. Um, most days, I start the day reasonably early, so I'm kind of awake by six and need to sort of read the competition, see what's what news is around. Um, and sort of get my head around the big issues, really. Um, it can be a little challenging trying to read four newspapers before you sort of even get out of bed. Um, although I try to have read my own before I leave the office the night before. 
Um, but, you know, there's a lot of words in the Australian. <laughs> um, so generally I do sort of skip through, you know, get a sense of the stories. And I listen to Radio National um, every morning. Fran Kelly is, you know, part of every day. Um, and so then we have a morning news conference by nine and that's a sort of time to really set our focus for the day. We talk about all the big stories and we do a national hookup with our counterparts at The Age, the Canberra Times, our Federal Politics Bureau, um, our little Brisbane office, the Brisbane Times. And, um, and it's great, it's a good opportunity to talk about the, everything that's happening, has happened overnight in the world space, like what's happening in um, other parts of the world through our foreign desk. Um, talk about domestic, what's coming up, what we need to be aware of. And these days we're very focused on different time points through the day. So we have what we call, like on our digital site now, we have an edition-based website. So we try to not move things around so frenetically as has been the case in the past. But of course when breaking news happens it and it's big, we put it straight at the top of the homepage. But we try to really focus our attention on those audience peaks. So. We feel there's a really large, that, well, we know there's a very large audience in the morning around seven, between seven, uh, sort of 6.30 and eight-ish. And then, so we have a 6 a.m. We set the homepage from six. Then we have a nine o'clock changeover, and that's a lot of time when a lot of office workers get to there. And it's off, and we see a bit of a, a spike in readers then as people are checking in with the day on, on the Herald. And then there's a huge lunchtime audience. Like actually lunchtime is our biggest audience of the day. So um, between, so we, so we reset the site again at midday and there's a big peak between sort of 12 and 1, 1.30. Um, and then we do it again for the evening. So oh, two more editions actually um, for around five for the commuter peak and then for the evening audience, which we, we often call mum zone, which is, you know, just a, a way of encapsulating that, you know, parents, kids are either doing homework or in bed and they can kind of collapse on the sofa and check in with the world. So we find there's that, that for example, that's a time when education stories do really well and, and various kind of health and health sort of stories do really well through that time as well. So my day is very focused on thinking about that. Um, uh, we have, so we have a news conference at nine o'clock and then at half past two, which is the afternoon one is very much looking through to those evening digital sessions, but also of course the newspaper. Um, we, it's where we decide on, after, after getting briefings from all those same people again, um, we really focus on what uh, we think the newspaper audience is, is going to be wanting to read the next morning, our curated version of, of the day's events and throwing forward into the next day, obviously. So that sort of, I mean, in between all of those things, I'm dealing with staff issues, um, you know, writing notes to subscribers or dealing with marketing or I do work a little bit with our commercial team on, on some, in, you know, projects and trying to like catch up with actually the news and read it um, is also something that I do. And then I have a few things on in, the, in some evenings. Um, as I say, we've got a big push at the moment for our subscriber base. Um, and I talk to them, I do monthly events with them. I had one on Monday night and yeah, they do take up, they do take up a bit of brain space. I'm often, I'm preparing for those and um, doing, you know, some research and stuff through the day. So um, yeah, it doesn't stop. <laughs> and certainly the way we consume news mm. nowadays has, has changed certainly yeah. in the last, yeah. in, rapidly in the last 10 years or so. How has, um, you know, now having a digital presence and, and those online uh, media impacted the way the, the newsroom operates? You've sort of mentioned you've got mm. multiple deadlines you hit throughout the day, so clearly that's yeah. one of the big changes. It is, and I think we, I think the Herald and, and other Fairfax publications have, they were pretty early adopters um, and you know, rightly or wrongly, and I, I'm not really here to make a judgment on that, sort of rushed headlong into it and and embraced it. And that's the reason, largely, that the Herald has the, still has the largest cross-platform audience of all media in the country, um, almost 5 million readers per month, which is huge. Um, now, it's been argued, and I don't disagree, that part of the reason we got such a mass audience was because of a certain type of content. People use terms like clickbait and the like. Um, I just prefer to say it's, it, was an, it was a deliberate tactic to get a large audience and it worked. Um, what we're trying to do now is sort of reframe that conversation around 
what is it that people really want and what is it that they're willing to pay for. So I think in terms of our digital content, you may have noticed a shift to bigger investigations that we do really well online and make them as sort of schmick and um, you know, cut, sort of on cutting edge technology, um, incorporating a lot of multimedia elements. Those sort of those are the sort of things that, and, and prioritizing our um, commentators, the insights that you can't get anywhere else. Um, I mean, I I sort of said to our, my print, so I have print editors, like I, I sit over print and digital, but I ha sort of, I can't do everything. Um, so I have some great editors who, who focus on either just the newspaper or just the website. Um, but I've said to all of them, like, you have to give people thing, like something or lots of things that they can't get anywhere else. Otherwise, they're not going to pay for it. I mean, to me, it's as simple as that. Um, that's why, you know, I know that it might be annoying for people, but I am determined to keep putting the word exclusive on the front page as often as possible because while the Australian likes, you know, the Australian likes to do it for the same reason we do, it's because readers will go, oh, that's something that I'm not, that no one else is getting. Um, so for me, but that works, it works in the newspaper, but it also works on the online as well. And for me, we have to build a sustainable business and it needs to be funded by the people who want to read us and f and you know by doing you've got to give them a what they want and b things they can't get anywhere else i was going to ask about because i'm really fascinated by this sort of digital versus print or traditional yeah. so at, at um, the sydney morning herald are the, the newspaper and digital offerings sort of separate or are they integrated how and and you know how so do you split your time between the the two so we try it very much to keep it's we look at it as one newsroom well i do um and, and everyone who works there it seems to um at our conference uh and at both particularly the morning well morning and afternoon conference my digital editor will say when can i have that when can i have that and sometimes there are embargoes imposed by the you know if it's a medical journal a story from a medical journal you know there will be hard embargoes um that are midnight or, or so that they have to be for the paper only in that in the in the beginning um, but there's a real we try to have a real conversation and a real um, like when is the audience going to want this story most people used to talk about you know digital first journalism that's where everything as soon as we got it went straight online for me I, oh, I think we all adopted a more sort of audience first when is the time that this story is going to be read by the most people and have the greatest impact so in smaller newsrooms we have to really focus on priorities and 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 getting more impact out of every piece of journalism because we can't do everything anymore. Um, the days of the, you know, journal of record that people still like to call the Herald, as sad as it is, it sort of doesn't really exist anymore. We can't physically do it with the resources that we have. Um, so we have to put our time and energy into the, the stories and the issues that matter to our readers. So. For me, it's a kind of a balance because the two, two audiences are quite different. Um, the print readership is uh, older, um, more considered. Um, the the but then like everyone has a mobile phone, so um, everyone can read you know the website online too. And you know there are different there are just certain different stories that resonate resonate more. Um, I try to not have a favourite child, um, <laughs> print or the, you know, the print, the paper or the website. Um, but there is nothing like, I mean, Judith, my old boss used to say, um, you know, there, there's nothing more fun than putting out a newspaper. Um, and it's kind of true. Um, <laughs> by, you know, crafting those headlines, by, you know, choosing the right photo and, and I mean, it, I still do love at five o'clock wandering over and having a conversation with my print editor about, and saying to him, "Is that really? Do we really want to use that photo?" And and you know, I, either I've chosen a different one, or we have it. You know, we have a conversation about it. And um, there was actually an example quite recently where um, it was a slightly risque photo to be putting on the front page, and I ended up polling the entire <laughs> office to get a sense of what people might say if this photo of a male model with his just um, it was a story about. Um, uh, I think it was a swimwear, it was a case study for a story about a business, but it just happened to be a swimwear story. And there was a man in sort of 
budgie smugglers, um, <laughs> under, you know, underwear. And I, I polled the whole office just to see who'd be offended or not. Um, and it was quite fun. <laughs> and we ended up running the photo. <laughs> So anyway, I, I think look, there, the paper's great. The website is um, is a beast, uh, you know, of itself, and the metrics that we have and the way we can track. In some ways, it's an easier thing to edit because the audience tells us what they want to read. Other than our calls about the things that might not be the most popular or might not be the most, you know, at first glance the most interesting. If if we say it's important for readers and we put it at the homepage, that's our call uh, to make. So we try very much to let the audience drive what they're reading at the top of that site. You mentioned that you know you still want to be able to publish exclusive on, yep. on the front page. Yep. How do you lead the news agenda when there are so many competing news outlets and social media and all of those? I think one of the biggest traps that I know that I've fallen into but I think a lot of media outlets do is that they write stories for their contacts and for in people of importance. Um, you know, I know full well that the National Energy Guarantee is one of the most complicated and difficult mm -hmm. policy areas um, to, to get into, I, but it's also really important that people understand that. And look, it took me a long time to get my head around it, but when you see story after story of sort of iterative, like very low level, minor bickering and whatnot, that's actually not helping. And I think we've seen with that issue in particular, a real conf level of confusion and disengagement with the story because there's almost, you know, people are writing stories for their contacts, like because they want that, that secret person who says the report's rubbish, this report's, you know, like, so all this stuff doesn't actually help. Um, I think, one thing that we really, I really try to do is when tossing up between different stories for the front page or different priorities through the day, it's like, well, imagine your typical reader, think about the cross section of our readership, wh wh which one is going to be more interesting and who does it affect the most too? I mean, I often think sometimes other publications get stuck down issues that are pretty niche um, and pretty one-sided. Um, I just think, I just, well, I hope that people are bored by that because I don't think that when, it, when you're talking about what affects people's lives day to day, that's why transport, urban development, um, health, education, these issues are huge for our readership because it affects them. Everyone's got, you know, either kids or nieces or you know, parents or what, who, who are engaged or need health, healthcare or educational, these issues are really core to what we do because, because people care about them and it affects their lives. Endless debate about, oh, so many of the things. It just becomes, just becomes meaningless to people and they tune out and I think it gets very boring. So, look, people, you know, people can have their different views on that stuff, but um, I just really think in terms of setting the agenda, it has to be, you know, our public interest test is still the one, you know, what are people going to care about? Um, on Saturday afternoon, the editor of the Sun Herald, who re still reports to me, because I actually, my job goes across seven days, um, she called me and was like, oh, I'm tossing up between two stories for the front page and wanted to just have a chat about it. Have you, you know, and I was more than happy to do that. Um, and it was, again, it was a story of, um, you know, a, bit, a suggestion that there is some um, uh, selection, you know, gender selection in pregnancies um, going on, or a story about Sydney's urban development. Um, and again, I was sort of like, oh, which is, and on a Sunday morning, like we sort of went through all the issues and while both be hugely interesting and were really well read, we ended up going with the, um, the gender selection for, um, you know, the, particularly like because it will debate, people will debate it and be interested to know that this has happened, it might be happening, and it just became more of a talking story, even though development and, and that story was really, was really great also. It seemed to me that we've heard a lot about that, and, but in terms of the bang story for, for the, to start the conversation, that, that other one was the one. So that's what we settled on. So conversations like that also really help think, you know, you just sort of bounce off each other and think, okay, well, what's, what are people going to be talking about tomorrow? 
Now, you mentioned that Sydney Morning Herald continues to have the highest cross-platform yeah. readership across mm -hmm. all media in Australia. What do you attribute that success to? Um, I think people know that what they're getting is not fake news. Um, I think we're a brand who has been around for 187 years. Um, I think we are almost, I think it's we are the, uh, the oldest continuous um, publishing newspaper, the second, I think it's the second longest continuously publishing newspaper in the world. Um, uh, I think that people know that intrinsically um, and therefore trust us. Um, I know that there's a lot of, you know, ah, you're too left wing, ah, you're too right wing, oh God, you can't please everyone. <laughs> um, so therefore, I like to think that if you're being attacked from both sides, then you're kind of in the middle. Um, and I think even though we've had periods of time where different editors have taken it in different directions, I like to think that we've been reasonably consistent in what we've done and serving our communities and our audience. Um, I think the in terms of the large audience, I'm not convinced it's necessarily, I mean, it's a big voice to have, but I think a lot of those people, and this is what we're kind of drilling into now around, are they people that are gonna pay? Are they, because a lot of them are not. Um, it's no, it might be quite surprising to hear that I think it's only 5% of our total size of our audience. Um, I think 5% makes up 50% of our digital revenue, so, it's a, that those numbers are pretty out of whack in terms of people who pay, like the, the size versus the people that are paying for it online. So we kind of need to redress that a bit. I mean, you know, a lot of entertainment stories or a lot of that more commoditized news that we still want to do because readers still want to read about it, doesn't, if it goes viral, that's not actually, I mean, yes, it's adding to our total reader numbers, but it's not actually helping up us do the kind of journalism that I think is important. So, um, and I think that we would all agree is Im important. Um, I think we're never anyone's friend in politics. I think, um, I always like to say that Peter Harcher, our international and political editor, I wouldn't know who he votes for. Um, and I speak to him a lot. I read pretty much every word he writes. Um, and if he hold him out as an example, he attacks both sides with equal venom, um, <laughs> credits them where it's due. And as I say, I wouldn't know who he votes for. And I think that's really important in the kind of politics. I mean, I want people to have opinions. I think that's hugely important. And I want to, people to read, even if they, if you don't like Elizabeth Farrelly, that's absolutely fine. But people still read her for the reasons that, you know, it's a debate and we can, we can have those debates and conversations. So I think all of, for all of those reasons, um, that's kind of why we're still around and plan to be for quite some time. <laughs> and just on that, I'll ask one final question, yeah. then we might open it uh, up to the, to the audience here. Where do you see, particularly for, for the newspaper side of things, where do you see the, the industry going in the future? Because we're hearing a lot about, you know, newspapers <laughs> yeah. are dying. Yeah, that's true. And look, that it is true that newspaper circulation is still falling and um, it's a, you know, 10% year on year, it does seem to, um, to go to fall. Um, I think there'll always be a place for newspapers. Um, they may not be in the form that we see them today. They may not be seven days a week. Um, I mean, a couple of years ago, there was huge speculation that we were going to stop printing during the week and only have Saturdays and Sundays. Um, that isn't commercially viable right now because the actual distribution of newspapers is the expensive part. It's not expensive to print a newspaper per se. It's expensive to get it to people's homes and where they need to read it. Um, th and as that number falls, the cost of the trucks and the overtime and the labour to get that to happen is going to become increasingly prohibitive. One thing we've just done um, is actually a deal with News Corp for the first time um, around our printing and distribution so that we're sharing the trucks that the papers go out on, um, we're, you know, sharing the printing presses and, and printing the paper, like, so within a couple of weeks, every person who, who is a print subscriber in the metro area will get an edition that is sent from the newsroom, not at 7.30 as it currently could be, 
but actually later, so 9 or 10.30 p.m. So that's really exciting for us because we've been quite restricted in um, the, t the you know, most up-to-date we can get. And, and I mean, I know, I know people who complain to me who live in Balmain who get the first edition, which is the earliest. So, you know, when we can, we can sort of ha be almost guaranteeing that people in the metro area are getting a pretty late edition like they would at News Corp, then that's, that's awesome. Um, so I think there's still, I don't think print's dead. Um, I think it's probably got three to five years um, for a seven day a week operation. I mean, this new printing deal is, three, is a three year deal. Um, so after that, there may be some reassessment, but I think there's still a long way to go. And you know, I think people in the world of fake news want publishers that they can trust. And so I think we're in a pretty good space for that. <laughs> Fantastic.